Uh, welcome, everybody, to the latest uh, Joe Dell webinar. It's my absolute pleasure today to be working with uh, Will Lloyd and Kate Percival from uh, P the PLN, um, the Pref Pref Professional Learning Network. And um, sorry, start again from the Primary <laughs> primary Languages Network, even. Um, PLN also stands for Professional Learning Network, but that's not what we're talking about today. It's really brilliant to, to be with everyone on the 9th of May 2022. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to, uh, to Will to start us off. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please put them in the chat and uh, I will put them to uh, Will and Kate at different moments during the webinar. So over to you, uh, Will, and thanks ever so much for agreeing to do this. Oh, no problem at all. This is um, a real pleasure for us to be able to talk to you guys today. Uh, we want this to be in, a, in the style of a workshop, so absolutely feel free to interrupt us uh, if they feel like a good question has come along. We'll try and get, answer everybody's uh, situation um, because today is all about helping you guys become, become proud of your primary languages. And we're gonna offer simple strategies and insights to support effective and quality languages provision. It's a pleasure today for me to be with Kate Percival who is our primary languages consultant at the company. She spends a lot of time working with our coordinators or the coordinators that are in our network, helping them to see languages differently inside their school uh, from a more strategic element. So we're hoping that you can take a load of free stuff away today, use it in your, um, in your how you uh, outlook or outlay your languages. I just wanna say hello, Kate, to, the, to everybody. Sure, yeah, good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. So thank you to Joe for having us. And, uh, and yeah, thanks to Will for, uh, for inviting me along. Cool, right, we'll crack on. So if you don't know who we are, um, this is what we do. Um, so we, like I say, we, we, we focus on making uh, schools proud of their primary languages. And we do it with these four promises here. So we transform your whole school's outlook and language learning. We can enable your non-specialists to engage in and enjoy teaching languages using our video lesson schemes of work and all of the CPD we offer. We make a positive impact upon children's progress because of this. And we also develop staff leadership and subject coordination skills via a full uh, CPD journey and comprehensive support system that we're really proud of as a company. And that's kind of what we're focusing on today is that, that red bubble, which is developing your, your staff, your own leadership skills and coordination skills. So hopefully today you can pick up some loads of points that you can apply inside uh, your school. So this is what we're focusing on today. And this is what Kate, when she does her consultancies with schools, she uses this performer as the uh, umbrella of what's in, what we count as important. And we're gonna cover each of these topics over the next hour. We're gonna try and show loads of different examples of good practice, um, things that you can take away, ideas for you to use. Um, and hopefully it'll give you a nice sense of strategy and planning to the way you look at your coordination. So in particular, the five points without going into too much depth right now is effective coordination, teaching and learning, we count these as the two primary um, uh, factors, don't we, Kate? These are the two. two yeah, important. they're sort of the, the, the bed and butter, really, of day-to-day of, of -day MFL provision. Exactly. And that's why there are kind of primary colours of purple and orange, if you know our, our kind of branding. The other three are important, but without the, other, without the first two, that, you know, we should, you should really be focusing on those first two. If you think they're probably one of the weaknesses. Uh, but the other three are celebrating languages in school. So we're thinking about ambas language ambassadors, European day languages, and other home uh, things, for example, home languages. School ethos, what does your school think about languages? What mindset do are you instilling in your students and your children and your staff about languages? And then of, finally, number five, which is community reach. Do, your par do the parents know about, or your parents do, or the majority of the students' parents, do they know about um, languages at school? Is it getting home? Do the governors care? Do they want languages to uh, thrive in your school? What do SLT think about languages and, and, and the great work you're doing inside your school? So we're gonna try and cover all five of those points. Uh, like I say, lots of um, stuff to share, lots of ideas to share. So let's crack on with point number one, which is effective coordination. So what do we need? I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, quickly summarize and then Kate's gonna go, gonna go into a bit more depth. Uh, with each of the points because this is her level of expertise we're on about confidence subject knowledge as a coordinator covering the 12 attainment targets the program of study four skills of list learning uh, four skills including listening speaking reading and writing key documentation in your coordinators file supporting colleagues your own cpd 
Are you, are you delivering your own CPD? Planning for both the medium and long term, uh, oversee uh, tracking and assessing, preparing for inspections, offsteads, and core skills progress. So I've kind of done it this way, Kate, because which do you think here is the kind of the most important to for, for a coordinator who's looking at developing their coordination skills? I think for coordination, it's about um, having that scheme of work that really supports what you're trying to achieve and has progress built in. So it might even be that we are straight down to the bottom and go to our core skills progress document, because yeah. this is something that we as a company are really proud of, is that it's something that's developed over a few years, actually. And um, as of very recently, it's become an interactive document as well, hasn't it? Has. So I'll click um, on that then and we'll yeah, let that load. Good through so what we've, so got, this... we've got the four stages of learning so we refer to stages not ages at PLN so the first year of language learning we call stage one so that might be year three or it could in fact be year five or year six so it's really important that we refer to them as stages not ages and then as we go across the table you can see the four core skills of listening speaking reading and writing and how they progress throughout the stages absolutely now the best way to explain it we could read it out, but that's a little more boring than actually seeing live students doing it. And we focus on, so we're going to click on each of the examples. So here's number one. Hola. Me llamo Luis. Estoy bien. ¿Cómo te llamas? Un caballo. Los caballos. Quisiera una... Manzana, por favor. Okay, so what do you extract from this? Well, me personally, I'm extracting the fact that it's not all in one go. He's pausing in between each things of the each separate statement. He isn't doing it from memory. Um, there are imperfections to the, his accent. So any Spanish speakers here, you'll notice differences. But equally, he's getting key phonetics right or key sounds right. The double L sound, for example, he's getting bang on every time. He's when he's doing as a question, you can tell he's asking a question. And even tricky words like quisiera, he's getting correct. And, and he, but, but where he could work on is his Zs, for example. So it's not perfect, but that's kind of what your average student looks like, isn't it, Kate, at stage one? Definitely. I think it's really realistic as well. So it's quite reassuring, isn't it, that it doesn't have to be 100% perfectly pronounced. What we always say is that for the speaking targets, we want the children to be understood by a sympathetic native listener. So if they understand what they're trying to communicate, um, so that, you know, the message has been put across, then, then they've done the job, haven't they? And if we go back to the document, what you'll see for stage one is that it really is about uh, single words or just set phrases that the children are learning. So what that video exemplifies there is saying or repeating, because that is absolutely fine at stage one, um, a few short, simple phrases, a few single words, there you go, understood by a sympathetic native speaker. So we just thought that a little video like that would make you go, all right, OK, that's that's kind of where we're where we're aiming for by the end of that first year. And then obviously it will build up quite, quite pronounced in a quite pronounced way from there. Yeah, let's have a look at uh, number two, stage number two, year two of learning. Tengo un hermano. Me duele la cabeza. I'll just turn up a bit. Donde está... La panadería. La serpiente es larga y verde. Hey, one, once again, not perfect, um, but understood, easily understood by um, uh, by a Spanish sympathetic speaker. His frequencies improved. The way the amount of words you can say in a sentence is increased. Uh, kind of his his tempo and frequency is definitely better from the first one as well. He's kind of speaking in the flow of of Spanish. Um, but there's once again, there's still imperfections in there, but we are being understood. Uh, Kate, do you want to kind of add some content uh, into yeah, the grammar, definitely. et cetera? I like the way, first of all, just to mention the little action for La Cabeza. So he's remembered from his lessons, no, no doubt he's learnt body parts by pointing to all the different parts of the body. And that just comes naturally in communication. So I think that's really um, to be celebrated, actually. Um, but also, if you look at that last example, La Serpienta es Laga y Verde, we've got a, an extended sentence there. So actually, this is pretty... Um, you know, what is, it's obviously very scaffolded still at this stage, but they have looked at adjectives and they are describing using a verb um, what an animal is like using a couple, maybe uh, different adjectives. So that's you can see how it's developed. Once again, though, each of the phrases are segmented. He's not expected at this point to still to say it at in all in one go. Once, no, it's just and as you can see in the description, just let me load back. 
it's it's once again you can pronounce familiar words and some new words it's a range of familiar spoken phrases we're not talking about paragraphs yet or even really complete sentences it still is just a kind of phrase work let's have a let's dive straight into stage three this is kind of we, we say it's changed as well it looks a little different um <laughs> and um this is now getting on to quite you know mo majority of students will probably finish at stage three you know stage, the, it's quite hard to get those four years in and a lot of you know so, so this is getting on to quite a tricky i'd say let's press play estoy mal porque tengo hambre y tú se llama louis tiene nueve años me gusta ciencia porque es interesante no me gusta geografía. Llevo una camiseta grande y verde. Okay, so some really tricky, challenging words for, for Charlie to say there. <laughs> Does a great job. Um, there's still, once again, imperfections, but the tempo's improved once again. He's got words like because in there. He's now got verbs to describe somebody else. Tiene, he's now using in, in, in the sentence structure. And is this, this is now starting to look more like sentences, isn't it, Kate? Definitely. So what he's doing is um, this will have come out, out of one of the lessons at stage three where the children take parts of, um, well, we call it rainbow writing. We'll cover that a bit later. But they, they take one part from each section of the rainbow um, and they put their own sentence together independently. So it's more personalised. It's expressing opinions. We've got the conjunctions in the middle to join ideas together. We've got um, adjectives to express why someone might like or dislike something. So it's really given a bit more free reign to what the children can say and obviously what they can write as well. And um, it's it's yeah it's definitely it's you can see a bit of a step change actually between stage two and stage yep. three and i think this really is, illustrates that 100 percent um and um but i will note it's once again we're still just working in sentences here. it's this he's, yep. and we're not expecting charlie at stage three to be able to say a paragraph just yet you know he, he is allowed to have a break in, in between the sentences as, as what we call expected progress and just to look at the detail again so i'm just keeping moving my zoom around um we're talking about the main points from a series of spoken sentences and answer, ask and answer simple questions on several topics and can express opinions. Opinions kind of the big thing. They can start to use the words because, but, okay. Let's have a look at stage four. So this is kind of what your average Me stage four student will achieve if they go through four really solid years of learning through key stage two. So this is a notice, it's an, all this is all in one go. Notice this is all in one go. Me amo Charlie. Tengo diez años. Vivo en Manchester. Estoy bien porque estoy feliz. Tengo un hermano. Se llama Louis. Tiene nueve años. Me gusta la gimnasia porque es divertida. Me encanta el fútbol porque Es rápido y un reto. Me gusta español. I'm sorry if it could just cut up. You can't see the writing at the bottom there, guys. But um, I'm sure you can still get the gist of it. It's not perfect. Well, it was just a spontaneous love of languages, that last bit, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is, I think um, what's, what's really nice with this is we've um, also just developed into, if you're, if you're a PLM member, in um, Summer 2, Stage 4, we have developed a resource called Read All About It, haven't we, Will? And this is kind of an example of what we would expect the children to be able to do all in one go, whether it be spoken or even as a written version of this by the end of four years of language learning. So it could be what the children do at the end of year six, which gets sent up to their high schools. So the, the high school teachers can actually see um, what the children are able to do and what skills they've developed. And that's a lovely little bridge with transition. I think yeah. I'm really looking forward to using this. Yes. Um, things to note here. Once again, he's not doing this from memory. We're not expecting it from memory. He'll have probably read. Well, he has written this out beforehand and then said it off after writing it. And there's probably been some framing for his writing, which we'll show you in a bit that he'll probably use for some of these parts. Some of them he'll know, like you could tell in the earlier part, the first paragraph, it was definitely he's been doing that for years with so that bit comes off him easy but he's only just learned sports very very recently learned sports 
uh, in, in stage four. So with that, you can tell he's, he's, his brain is working hard, but he is trying his best to sound Spanish, isn't he, Kate? Mm -hmm. He certainly is. So um, I think we had so a question just then, which I think our network coordinator, Catherine, and managed to answer in the chat. But just to reiterate, so this document is, is the same document, it's saved in the same place as it always has been, isn't it? Yeah. It's just recently been made um, interactive. Correct. It's something I've always wanted to get in that core skills progress sheet, um, and we've at last managed to get it done. So hopefully you guys are taking some value from uh, that that sheet there. We wanted to make sure you guys saw it. I'm just going to get back onto where we were. Were we here? We were here. We were here. Yeah. Is there anything else on this slide you'd like to talk through, Kate? Or Let's have a think. I think just again how proud we are at PLN of the support that we give to coordinators. I'm a coordinator. I'm also a class teacher, so I'm in a lot of your <laughs> shoes and I'm doing it day to day. And it can sometimes feel like quite a lonely role when there's just you doing it for the whole school. So I think what we offer is that chance to be able to network, certainly. So we have our networking twilights once per term, which people say are just absolutely brilliant because it's that chance to, to chat and discuss and to skill share and to talk about successes, but also stumbling blocks and things that people still need help and support with. So I'm really proud of that, that um, opportunity that we, that we have, which is all inclusive in membership for, for PLN. Um, and yeah, the CPD journey that's, uh, that's I'm sure you'll be talking about a little bit later. As yes. Well. And from an external, if you've done, you know, if you're not a network member and you want to go this your own way, I'd be kind of saying to you, um, does your school know what to expect? So do they know what stage four looks like? Do they know year three or year, year two or year one of learning language? Do they know what the steps look like? Have you paved that way well enough? Um, is their long-term planning built layer on layer? Is each year built as um, on top of each other in order for them to be expanded? For example, we introduce animals in stage one and then we start to describe animals, okay? And then we might add a verb in, into those sentences as well in the next stage. So are you building it up correctly in, in terms of grammar? And these are all just questions that you should be hopefully answering in your head right now and thinking, yes, no, maybe. Are you ready for an Ofsted inspection? Do you have your folder ready with correct documentation to show that you are coordinating this subject correctly? And in, as a basic kind of gauge is, are you regularly action planning? And are you regularly reviewing those action plans to show whether you've made progress on steps, whether small or, or big? So that's kind of just as a brief, what we want you to be thinking as coordinators is, are you action planning? Are you spotting weaknesses and working on them? Or are you ignoring them? And that's kind of like as a general rule, isn't it, Kate? Definitely. And weaknesses, if, as long as you recognise them, we always say this, don't we, when we're, when we're training coordinators, they're just as important as strengths, because as long as you're aware of them, then you're being an effective coordinator. Correct, exactly. It's kind of like not being afraid of your weaknesses. Yeah. The, 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 pro the biggest problem would be if an inspector spotted a weakness and you couldn't see and it. you hadn't. You yeah. hadn't seen it. The, yeah. the, if, if you can go, yeah, we know we're working on this, we're trying our best, and this is the, the plan in place. Mm -hmm. So it's that mindset of, okay, okay, it doesn't need to be perfect, but if you can spot the weaknesses, because for, for, I won't spend too much longer on this point, but for example, we have fantastic... Oh, through COVID, we have people that had everything ready before COVID. COVID struck. A year later, they've now noticed that the speaking's decreased, you know, and in a school that would have been ready for action, they now need to go, well, we're actually a step behind on that and we need to identify that and then we can work on it and then hopefully we get it back to where it was before COVID. Mm. And it's right. something we, we support okay. with in terms of that, that if you are in the Ofsted window, that's sometimes what schools ask me to come and support with. It's just that preparation for um, a visit, an inspection by whoever it might be, just so that you feel 100% confident that yes, you can talk about your areas of, of skill and your areas of weakness and your action plan and your steps for progression. So, um, so that's something that we, we can support with as well. Great, okay, let's go to the next point. So that's your effective coordination in a nutshell. Um, just some resources that you might find as an effective coordinator using the assessments we've got. Have you got that we have knowledge organizers? Do you have big knowledge banks that you could use and put on your website, school website, so teach parents can see what knowledge has been learned? Uh, medium term plans, long term plans, etc. I just put a selection of photos in there. Yeah, and they've all got those audio buttons, haven't they, Will? So if, a, if a teacher feels that they are a non specialist, although we don't like that term non specialist because all primary teachers are specialists in primary pedagogy, um, but you know, occasionally teachers will say to us, Well, I, I don't, I can't speak Spanish, I can't speak French, I'm a non specialist. We need to be supporting those, those teachers to be able to deliver quality 
and realistic provision. So that's where those audio sound files from our native speakers, so Emily and Irene, um, they are throughout our entire scheme of work and they are really, really useful for, for all teachers, but certainly for those who feel they lack slightly in confidence. Right then, next point, teaching and learning, just as equal, well, I, to be fair, actually effective coordination is the foundation, but teaching and learning is, I'd say is equally as important as effective coordination, I'm sure you'd agree, uh, Kate. And I'm sure everyone, it's yes. obvious, isn't it? So, it's an obvious statement, really. To summarise teaching and learning, these are the key factors. And obviously, you get the recording this, so you can have a look at these. Consider each of these points with your teaching and learning in your school. Consistency of teaching. How frequently and for how long is, is, is a language is being taught? A general rule for us is if it's 30 minutes for 10 times a term, 30 minutes wow. a week, 10 times a term <laughs> is, pretty, is pretty good. You're doing well. I'd call, I'd call that gold <laughs> standard. 30 minutes a week in each class in key stage two, 10 times a term. So two kind of false, uh, false on weeks without it. Yeah, sports day and Christmas plays and all the rest Correct. of it. Anything above six or between six and eight is still quite good. But 10, 10 is like the gold standard is what you should be trying to hit to. Pedagogy, how is it being taught? How, is your, how are your teachers being supported? Um, is the scheme enjoyable to be taught? Do the kids enjoy learning it? The style of teaching? So these all consider these things. Basically, are you walking around classrooms and a kid's smiling inside the classroom and not for the wrong reasons? Uh, metacognition. Kate, do you want to explain this point? Yeah, so also known as self-efficacy. And that's something actually that I'm going to be talking about in um, the conference this year. So PLN does an annual conference. It's it's virtual again this year and it's free for anyone yeah. to join. So, so do sign up if that's something you feel like you would be interested in. And um, metacognition is is knowing how we learn it's simply that and knowing how we get better and how we make progress so if we can teach the children to recognize how they learn a language best then they're going to learn a language better and it's as simple as that so there's lots of strategies that we do without really knowing it without maybe communicating it to the children but it's about being really explicit and saying we're putting actions with these words because that physical that physicality helps our brain remember language and it's being open and obvious with them and that obviously proves to then help with memory definitely definitely i know self-efficacy is massive with um especially stuff but especially most subjects but yeah. especially stuff like languages and like physical education the the the, the 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 confidence in oneself to do a task correctly is massive and having skills and backup plans is always a, a really good way of supporting that so there's a progression, Kate. Would you like to uh, give it summarise this point? Yeah, so um, Ofsted tell us and, and the, the, the DfE, the government guidance that we have for MFL, they talk about these three pillars of progression, vocabulary, grammar and phonics being the, the foundations really for language learning. But really, really importantly to remember as well that it's not just about the words and the sounds. It's also about that cultural understanding that runs all the way through learning. So we're actually all we've always got in the back of our minds at PLN that we want children to grow up to become global citizens. So, yes, there's the communication element to it, but there's also that awareness and that empathy to um to people from different cultures different countries and that's what we're always trying to build in to our activities to our european day of languages um focus to our entire scheme of work in fact and i know it's a focus for a lot of schools in general so with uh, pshe curriculum and with global citizenship it really ties in with so many of those of those um priorities so it's definitely something to keep at the forefront of your mind um, I've just seen a question in the chat as well about the recommended time for uh, teaching languages per week. Um, I think it's Mrs. Buckley, who, who could be Victoria Buckley, but I might be wrong with that. Um, so, um, but anyway, 60 minutes is fantastic if you can achieve it, but there is no government recommendation that we know of that says 60 minutes per week. And more going, I'm going off the average the school that I teach to, which now is probably in the thousands in terms of what I see. And at 30 minutes per week, um, 30 plus minutes per week, eight times eight times a term, eight to 10 times a term is like you're doing like 75% better than most schools. Yeah, so. there's, there's no stipulation. And I think the DfE have done that purposefully because they don't want to be too um, prescriptive in uh, to schools. It's up to schools to manage provision with what works best with their context. So if what works best 
is an hour a week, great. If it's half an hour and then building up those extra bits of when you revisit language for maybe five minutes before the end of the day or two minutes just before going into lunch, then, um, then it may be um, built up like that. And, and I think what Ofsted say is that it's more effective that language provision is little and often rather than say blocking. So we really shouldn't really be seeing language taught sort of, you know, for a full afternoon, once every half term and then not again till the next half term because it, it needs to be repetitive doesn't it that recall yeah. retrieval needs to be um little and often so that it sticks in the head and so that um as uh dr michael wardle says he says what's left in the sieve doesn't he so it's yeah. about what the children can still remember after you've done all the lessons you've you know thrown all the content at them you did all the activities what can they still do right at the end of that? What can they remember from last week, from last month, from last year? Well, if, it, if it's been ages since they did it, then that it's not going to be as much as if you've been, you know, drip feeding it um, throughout the days and the weeks. Exactly. So it's just kind of not, not lowering the bar, but allowing that thirty minutes to occur. It's a lot can still a lot can still happen in thirty minutes of, yeah. of, of good of good teaching. Okay. Uh, it's just taking a second for it to come through. Assessment, so it's not a, assessment or some form of tracking, some form of AFL um, throughout the year. We've got our clouds that we have that we review, our I can statements throughout the year. We have also got a puzzle out assessments that you can do for each module. We don't think, well, I don't recommend doing an assessment every half term. Once again, gold, what does gold standard look like? Gold standard, and this is to the average school, is one assessment per on, on a, one assessment assessing each of the key skills, listening, speaking, reading, writing, once a term. Mm. Okay. With weekly or bi-weekly tracking, one minute though, one minute just doing a bit of tracking. Who can count to 10? Who can just say that animals? Who can remember the animals? Who can write the animals? Just some form of tracking and ticking along with one assessment a term is fantastic progress, isn't it, Kate? Definitely, and I think if you've got three over a year, you can see a trend there. So whether you plot it on a graph or whether you just have it in front of you, you can see what's going up, what's plateauing, where certain skill areas might need to be more developed. So if you've done it, like Will says, for the four skills, listening, speaking, reading and writing, you might see there's a definite improvement with writing, but actually the speaking side, due to a number of reasons, COVID and, and isolations and, and all the rest of it, maybe they've not had as much, practice, as much practice at that. And that might be an area for development that you can then see from from doing those assessments those assessments shouldn't be onerous as well they need to be well to me they've got to be done in one session <laughs> and yeah. some some teachers like to split them maybe especially with the speaking one um they they might try and do that over a number of weeks or the writing one they might build up to it and again that's what i really love actually about um that's you know people being confident with with the resources and the scheme of work that they're supported by and being able to fit it to their context so when I go in and support schools uh, one teacher said to me that they find it much more manageable to do the writing one building up over two or three weeks which is absolutely fine that works for them um but it needs to be that you know something you can do without loads of preparation with the speaking one you really haven't got time to sit with 30 children individually and listen to them no. speak or record them so what we say is often we try and train the children to peer assess each other with speaking but at the same time you as the teacher will need to maybe go around and listen into what we call borderline children so children that could be on the cusp of um emerging and um and meeting or meeting and exceeding and you'll know those children there's the children that some weeks really seem to get it some other weeks might be struggling so you might just do some um i call it a spotlight hand where my hand goes around the class and actually they're quite keen for the spotlight hand to land on them and then to have a go at speaking whatever it is we've been practicing so that's how we work the speaking thing and um, the other thing i've seen actually really nice idea in another school I visited in in manchester was a very simple way of tracking content throughout the term so um i think this this was done on a piece of paper and it was literally red amber and green dots like the traffic light dots but i've seen and heard as well other teachers talking about um an online version of this tracking system which could be set up very easily and i think people might tend to use it for all foundation subjects if their school subscribes to it um but it was basically the date with the um objective of the lesson children's names down the side and it was a red amber green and the teacher said to me that it takes a literally 60 seconds at the end of a lesson to do red amber green all the way down 
And if you imagine that over a course of 10 weeks, and you've got a real visual there all on one page of which child, um, you know, has, has, has flown absolutely all the way through and got greens everywhere, which children have maybe um, struggled with certain skills or which children are, you know, progressing and, and, and moving up, which is the way you want them to be going. So as long as they're in progressing um, and as long as they're there, I mean, that sounds obvious, but we've got to really be careful that we're not having children taken out of provision. So, I mean, I get it. I, I'm doing this job day to day and I'm, you know, my class teacher. So I know that we have children who, with COVID catch up for maths and English, et cetera, they are being given extra support and taken out for intervention. And that's, I can see why. But at the same time, we need to make sure that all children have access to MFL lessons as they do to all foundation subject lessons. Um, one girl said to me last week, actually, um, oh, I really, I don't want to go out this week because I've been out a few times now and I really like my language lessons and I don't want to miss it. So I think just even just for her sake, but that's, a, you know, it's a similar picture, unfortunately, in, in many scenarios that we're not taking the children out from the same lesson every week. I know it's hard, but a way to mitigate that risk is to maybe just have that frank and honest conversation with um, her teacher, senior leadership, and just say that, languages is a real sort of leveler for children and for those that do struggle with math and English often this is where they shine and they can really be creative and learn in a in a quite an active way which suits lots of children and can we just make sure that they're not always taken out of the same lessons yes and that that kind of I'll complete that point um by saying that assessment should always come after good teaching and learning um, you shouldn't just be assessing for the sake of it as uh, some of you might not be in the position that assessment is the right choice that could be a year down the line after teaching and learning has been established in the school let's not frighten the teachers off first let's not frighten the kids off either so if you but you may be in a really strong position where you can assess frequently because you are the specialist teacher and you are in the school and you're teaching it so you're teaching each of the classes in every class so you have that level of control so assessment should always come after teaching and learning and you should be very protective of the teaching and learning inside the classrooms. And you can reinforce teaching and learning through cross-curricular opportunities. There's loads of different subjects. And I'm, I'm thinking a few of the pictures will show in the pictures subsequently coming after this slide that you'll be able to see. Can I just one last thing on assessment? Of course, Kate. Of course. You are assessing in every lesson. Whenever, whenever you play, Simon says, for example, you are assessing which children can, can do the action. You're assessing a listening and a responding skill there. And that's a visual and it takes no extra time. You don't need to be writing it down, but you are assessing and you can see which children have got it and which haven't. And that goes for most activities that you do. So that's your formative assessment. So if you are not at the stage of formally assessing, like Will says, please don't be frightened because you are still assessing as you're going along anyway. Absolutely. Like, it's, it's very uh, clear to see, isn't it, who can pronounce a certain word incorrectly yeah. or incorrectly just by listening, um, just by the way they're focusing on work. It's no different, you know, no difference of throwing it, seeing a dip, two people, two kids throw a ball, like going, oh, he can, she can throw it further than, she can throw it quite far, she can't throw it that far. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, she can hit the target four times out of five, she can only hit it one times out of five. It's very easy to spot um, differences and, and then seeing progress as is like, oh, right, he's now pronouncing with the V correctly in Spanish, or he's saying the double L perhaps all of a sudden correctly. Mm -hmm. So there's clear markers as well without using assessment formally or formatively. Book work, evidence of work. I mean, that kind of relates, Kate, to what you were saying, really, about this week in, week out um, evidencing and kind of checking book work. Any tips? Any quick, quick top tips Just, about book uh, work? Yeah, main headline really on book work is have a book, <laughs> number yeah. one. Um, That's a good one. Yeah, and that book can travel the child through right the way through key stage two. So it's something that I'm actually implementing from September onwards. And actually, some schools I've worked with have also said they're going to take this approach. They're going to start to book in September, stage one, and that book is going to be a thick side book. It's not going to be one of the thinner ones, but that will follow them through right through to stage four. And I think what's great, going back to self-efficacy, they can then refer back to previous topics, to previous vocabulary, and they can use that to make them better linguists. So I think it's really important that that happens. And it's great actually to be able to show and demonstrate progress, isn't it? So anybody visiting school, any book looks, any yes. learning what you happen to be doing, it's all there, it's all evident. Definitely, great on your, on your websites as well, evidence of this progress, uh, learning walls, anything like that that shows progress over the four years, 
shows that layering is just gold dust really mm. and show it off if you've got evidence okay. of progress between these stages show it off as much as you can on twitter on on, on your website because they will look as well Ofsted mm. will look on your website for they're not that first yeah oh right the yeah. rfl's in good check maybe mm. i won't go to their subject or maybe i will it's like because we want to show it off mm. uh right people voice we will move through okay uh, we're gonna we're gonna just kind of quick fire zip through these examples of work that we make that kids do and so the schools send in to us okay this is rainbow writing this is a structure that we use to help pick kids from any ability build sentences essentially follow from left to right each is a column in itself and you pick one from each color to build a sentence so really anybody of any ability could create this we do try and challenge people can they use the e-word can they add more words onto it as well can they continue to describe it you can challenge more people but it just is, a, is an entry level for anybody to build sentences uh, complicated sentences in um, languages and kids really like to write in different colors or highlighting different colors after they've written the sentence i love how how inclusive it is as well so a child could just literally go to from the red column to the orange column stop there and put a full stop and that's enough for some children, but they've achieved, haven't they? They've written a full sentence yeah. that makes sense in the target language. They've been independent with it. They've not been told to copy it down. They've chosen which part they're going to use uh, and they've achieved. So I like the way that, you know, all children can access. There's a no ceilings uh, approach really to, to this kind of differentiation, which is really important. Um, but those that, that feel they want to go further have that free reign to do as well. Super friendly for those with learning difficulties as well. We've noticed uh, we've had it's really in, in, like, haven't we? Yeah, we've had lots of individual case studies, albeit so it's not like a mass uh, thing. But we've heard kids with autism, kids with ADHD, kids with other learning difficulties really enjoy the fact of seeing colours. Uh, it's a bit more it applies to their brain a little better than just seeing a load of foreign words on a piece of paper. So just consider how you frame your writing out um, for your students. We probably spent too long on that slide, but we'll keep going. Right, tongue twisters. What a great way to do speaking. Record tongue twisters. We've got loads of them on the on the network. I'm sure, you can find some yourself. But tongue twisters are just a brilliant way of practicing um, practicing key phonetics without it being too much like listen and repeat. So we use tongue twisters all the time. So why why not use them yourself? Uh, self building self efficacy by writing poems about self efficacy. This is you can be strong. You can be Marcus Rashford. You can be Anna Raducanu. You can be David Attenborough. So lots of using that lovely um, structuring with the verb puedes and ser. Um, so it's a lovely, uh, it's really a lovely poem that we use. You could do a similar poem. We've used sports people. You can use different, you could use artists, celebrities. Um, article limbo. Una, un. He, what you say there, you say these, you say serpiente, the students got to choose which side they go for. It doesn't have to be limbo. Could be anything. Could be throwing uh, a ball into the right goal. It could be, it could be whatever. Uh, Kate, do you want to say? Cocktail? Yeah, this is this is grammar, and it doesn't look like grammar, does it? It looks fun and it looks bright and colourful. So this is masculine and feminine nouns. So we call this grammar fruit kebabs or fruit and veg kebabs. So it's with our healthy eating topic uh, in spring one, and it's just you have to choose um, nouns which are either all masculine for one kebab or all feminine for another kebab. You could even do plural nouns for another one. Um, you could make it into patterns. And it just is, it's a visual, isn't it? So the children find it more interesting in creating something like this than, than simply writing them or, or, or even just sorting them into two columns. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll keep moving. Sometimes it's, it's just a second, here we go. On the right hand side, you've got yourself some action sentences. So they've created the sentences. For example, the middle one here, the lad has got two thumbs up, j'adore. And that is an action for le train fantôme, fantôme, which obviously means the phantom train or the spooky train. Um, and on the left hand side, we've got describing aliens, which is nice because there's a bit of creativity. And also we've got colors, adjective, adjectival agreement and placing correct placement mm. in the sentences as well. You'd be thinking sort of stage three. I, I think, think that's stage, stage two. two. Yeah, stage maybe. Two. So it's just a simple, it's a, it's a, it's an adjective. Yes, there is a bit. Oh no, maybe it's stage three because of, because of the J. Um, okay, this one it's is key three. questions, key questions, and it, but it's it's a, a building a planetary ID, a planet or outer space identification. So we got these key questions we're asking the alien that they've got to answer. Uh, so there's loads of good questions there, and they've got the answers in the bottom. Sorry, that's just. 
Yeah, it's okay. really cool that, isn't it? So that's them revisiting prior language. It's all those key personal information questions that they've done previously. This is definitely stage three. And uh, what a fantastic picture as well. Look to be able to draw like that. Yeah, don't worry, guys. I will be will be I'll happily send these slides to people afterwards. So uh, I'm rushing through these these pictures quite because we've got quite a few. Um, this is just simple. We like to do use aliens because it's easy to talk about an alien dad or an alien mum if you don't have a mum or a dad yourself. So it's just good for the kids that are sensitive around family. So we can talk about the alien family instead. And it allows for different colours, different sizes, different heights, different amount of body parts. There's loads of creativity around the alien side of stuff. That's why we base most of our scheme around it. This is, we did a yoga mindfulness module. It's in the scheme of work. It is stage two, spring two. Um, uh, talking about the ver talking about turn, body parts, uh, spin. It's basic breathe instruction. In, breathe out, lots of mindfulness. Correct. And here yeah. they're just recording their sentences. They've obviously picked... The, the mindful part of the school in the near the trees mm. and they're trying to record themselves some um, routines uh, there on the left that, is, you know what, that, that is okay, sorry, sorry. i'm just going to say that's language real purpose as well though isn't it so those children know that they are speaking using the target language they're constructing it themselves they're being creative they're being independent and that is then going to form an audio or a video that other children can listen to and can relax to, can do yoga to, can be mindful to. That could be sent to their elite school. It could be sent to their, um, you know, a school down the road. That's something that, that really gives purpose to language. I love it. Uh, next slide, two seconds. Here we go. Just some other descriptions shown there, some color coding. You can see the rainbow colors they put in there for the different numbers, colors, face or body part nouns. And then also just a bit more colour coding with the sentence writing. This is um, lollipop sticks, just different colours for the different parts of the sentence. Yes, uh, the, writing, okay. the writing doesn't have to be with the pen and paper, does it? That's no. I think what we're saying. Writing is sentence construction. So for some children, again, that will make more sense than actually forming letters on paper or a whiteboard. So being able to pick one part of a sentence which is colour coded, which you know is, is the opinion phrase, and then the, the subject that they like or don't like, and then the conjunction, and then why with the adjective, and they can physically manipulate that sentence, that is writing. That You could take a photo of that, that could go in books, or at that point, they could copy down what they've, what they've um, actually put together. Okay, so, exactly. Okay, um, RT days on the left hand side, each day is a different style of artist, uh, famous artist. I'm not uh, that accustomed, uh, I don't know my artist that well, so I won't be able to say him, <laughs> but somebody might in the chat. Uh, on the right hand side is um, animals, animal flaps. Yes. Yeah, so uh, here is just, they make it in, in stage three, summer one, they make their own planets by the end of the module. So this is their description, El Planeta El Rojo, El Planeta Se Llama Pedro. El tiempo en nieve hace sol. El planeta hay un museo, un, un, porque, un parque, so, apologies, una serpiente, una, un ratón, un perro y los, los manzanas. So we've obviously said there what they can already say. So this is stage three. Uh, they're starting to build out these longer sentences without them being in a paragraph and using words that uh, he says, he says parque, not porque. Um, yeah, we've gone for this one. Uh, this is, oh, sorry, these are both describing houses, aren't they, Kate? Mm -hmm. both yeah. describing houses. Descriptions. Yeah, so you've got the sentence started, done my mise en yeah, and then the, it's, it's, it's basically a list, isn't it? A list of, of rooms with an adjective after it, but because it's displayed like this, it's just so much more creative and, and um, you know, interesting to do. Okay, keep moving forwards. Uh, this is just... Just to the different verbs, ideas for a football team, all different characters, and all using the different um, uh, conjugations for basic present tense verbs. This one is obviously to play. Okay, this is a different ways, two different ways of using colours. One rainbow. Can you? We've been doing. Can you? Can you write a, a different coloured object that applies to the different colours of the rainbow? Mondrian art. Um, I know Janet is a big fan of Mondrian art, and um, it's a very nice way of also revising the colours, along with learning new vocabulary to do with uh, items in the house. So it's yeah. a nice arty way of doing of doing colours and um, house parts. House parts with that together. that cultural strand running right through as well. Yeah, I don't know what house parts are, but house items. <laughs> 
Um, robot commands. Yeah. They learn this in stage two, and then they they practice a little bit of robot commands. You got savez-vous, répétez, écoutez, silence, silence, levez-vous. They program their friend, haven't they? Program their their robot. Yeah. Exactly. And this is a board game. We've got loads of board games on there. Oh, this is the I'm college board this game. This week, yeah, can't wait. They're going to love it. This is new, isn't it? A little board game for um, describing planets. Correct. The arty, arty words. What's good about that is they can make new words as well. So they could yeah. write maybe null or s. Um, so there's loads of, or um, you know, in French, they could do a French, yeah. they could do a French. So there's loads of different words they could use just by making letters like that. Cross group left. Okay, so that's the end of the teaching and learning. We will flit, start to flit. I'm very aware of the time, but they're the two biggest, they are the two most important topics. So we did want to spend the most amount of time on, on those. Um, because they're they're really the two, the two, the effective coordination, teaching and learning are the ones you if you get in line and going going well, the rest are just add-ons to make you outstanding. You can't really have an outstanding provision without those first two being in check. Okay, isn't that correct? I would say so, yeah. Cool. Right, celebrating language in school. Assemblies, certificates of achievement, languages and ambassadors, home languages are appreciating home languages, uh, displays, accreditation, special days, links with global dimension. Kate, do you want to add anything? To this? Yeah, it's just so um, the, the certificates is something I'm really proud of and I'm, I'm getting really good now at using them each week. And the children remind me if I forget. So we've got little language text of certificates which are linked to every lesson. And I've actually printed them out little postcard size and laminated them. And the children know that we're looking for a language detective, which is basically a child who it displays language learning skills. So they look for cognate words or neocognate words, or they make a link with a word with their home language or a link with an English word, or they maybe help somebody because they've finished and they're able to help someone with their work, or they just step out of their comfort zone maybe, which is you know quite quite a lot to ask a, a young person to, to, to speak in a, in a different language in front of the whole class. So we award a certificate each week and it's really um, helping with motivation. So I'm something, that's something I'm really proud of. Um, Accreditation as well. So we have the Primary Languages Development Award, which Catherine Sims is uh, is in charge of, and she can guide you through that process if it's something that you feel your school is ready for. And there's three different different entry points for that. Catherine will tell you more about it. But it's it's brilliant because it just means you can then track your progress against these five principles of primary languages that we're talking about this evening, and you can see whereabouts um, your school. Uh, which targets they hit into, you can provide evidence to prove that, and at the end of it, you've come out with accreditation, which can then go on letterheads, it can go on websites, and it's something for your school to be really, really proud of. In terms of special days and links for global dimension or kind of global understanding, the thing that we focused on this year, and I'm sure lots of you did as well, uh, was the AMAL stuff. Um, mm. Kate, do you want to just quick in a quick Yeah, so we launched this. Okay, 20 seconds. 30 seconds. 30 <laughs> seconds. Yeah. Wow, I could talk for 30 days on this. So Janet yeah. we came across this amazing um, art sort of installation event which was happening um, last year. And it was Amal the refugee who was walking. So she's a, she's a huge puppet. And the puppeteers from all these different countries you can see on the map walked her from Syria, from the border of Turkey, all the way through Europe, through France and Spain, which was an absolute gift to us learning French and Spanish, and through to the UK, and ended near where PLN is based in Manchester. So even some PLN schools, and uh, myself and my family included, went to kind of see her arrive in Manchester. So it was a huge cultural um, experiment, if you like, but also we looked at it from a linguistic point of view, and we, we thought of it um, in terms of empathy as well so what it would like to be a refugee and obviously that's even more pertinent now with what's happening in Ukraine but we decided that because it was the, the autumn term a lot of the children were learning about feelings words and emotions and how to express how they feel and that's a huge part of what we're doing with mental health drive at the moment after Covid as well so we decided to write some sentences in the target language as though we were a mouse so you can see on the screen now things like I'm happy because or I'm fine because I'm happy, my name is Amal, I'm scared, I'm tired, I'm not great because I'm hungry. So we did say that the range of emotions would be a bit like a roller coaster for her. Um, but she happened to meet a little uh, a friend in France. So we said, well, can we help Amal speak some French? And then she went to Spain, can we help her speak some Spanish? So it was a real gift for us and something we could be really creative with. So that was brilliant. Yeah. 
definitely caught the imagination of the company. Um, we used an authentic text as well, didn't we, this one? So yeah. it's um, Refugees Not My Name. So it was in French or Spanish or even in English. It's, there's a definite place for just reading the story about a refugee's experience uh, and the different emotions that they feel along the way. I think it um, this kind of relays back to the notion of, for, I know Jo, uh, Joanne, um, is really passionate about the idea of having a hook to your lessons and hooking students in some way or form into the language learning and keeping your ear to close to the kind of what's going on and trying to think, well, what would be a good hook in? It could be the World Cup. Maybe a kid like me, when I was a primary school kid, that's probably what would draw me in. It could be a mal, it could be something to do with refugees, it could be something to do with music or culture. It's just keeping your ear to different things that are happening and see if you can find these hooks into language learning. And mm. um, it could be really profound the impact that has in your school on languages itself. Uh, there's also packing for a journey task that we did, kind of links to it, um, just the, but also it links to the ideas of being a languages detective. So what things you need to pack on your way for a, learn, a learning journey of languages, listening ear, an open mind, a welcome sign, a globe, a map, a telescope, a smile. So just different ideas, different hooks, as I say, to language learning, to celebrate languages. And we've just some examples of schools creating their, their suitcases. Uh, and here we go with some key words that you might use. And this, I think, oh, I'm pretty okay, sure, is yeah. the languages, European yeah. Day languages song that um, we always give out for free. Thing. If you join, if you, if you sign up to the conference, which is completely free to do, you will get the European Day Languages song written by Joe um, uh, for you to use in your school. So we employ you to jump in and, and join in. This was a really good, um, what are they called? Sea chants. Sea chanty. Oh, sea yes. Chanty. Yeah. You didn't get it out of your head. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. Yeah. It yeah. was good because yeah. the kids could scream and shout and it, yeah. didn't, it didn't depend on like melody. It was more about the tempo and, and rhythm. Okay, two more points. We, we are on time, but um, like I say, these points are, are more just ideas for celebration. School-wide ethos and vision. Are the staff enjoying and get engaged in, like, in language learning? That's so massive that if the teachers are enjoying it, then the kids were more likely to enjoy it too. Are you running whole staff CPDs? If you're a network member, you get to do, you get a CPD as part of your membership. I will do a Zoom training with them. You can invite them on the Spanish and French upskilling sessions as well with Joe. But equally, if not, are you running them yourself? Are you asking SLT to have that half an hour slot or 45 minute slot in which you're training your staff, showing them, maybe you're teaching them something to do with the kind of something cultural, et cetera. SLT vision, basically, are you in their plans? And I always like to say an action plan is the currency of your SLT. SLT will take you more seriously if you come with them with an action plan saying, this is where we're at, this is where we're going to, and these are the steps I want to take. They might not say yes to everything, but they'll definitely say yes to more if you come with a solid action plan and with a little bit of know-how in terms of your understanding. And even if it's you going, I don't think I'm a good enough coordinator. I don't know enough. I want to know more. Can you put me on this course? Can you let me do this, please? That in itself is being a good coordinator, noticing that you, you might be the one that needs to needs the development first. Passion for the subject. Do you, uh, do you want your students to like, I always, I always say, think about, you want the students to see languages like you do. So if you're passionate about the language, do you want them to see it for with the way you do. So how are you making that happen in your, in your school? How are you trying to get that across? And I know it's a big challenge that guys, um, and I don't want to sound like I'm like poking a bear there or anything because sometimes the school doesn't have your backing or doesn't back your, what you want to do. But how are you getting the kids to see languages and the teachers to see languages like you do? And being language detectives, that's the big thing we focus on is taking these skills through primary, secondary school, learning Italian, French, German, Spanish, Latin, Arabic, Russian, Chinese, English, whatever it is. Can they take these skills through with them? Self-efficacy that's going to allow them to develop uh, and, and, and these cross kind of lingua, linguistic skills, I suppose. Kate, is there anything you want to add to that slide? No, just you said it all. It's brilliant. Just with um, the, the CPD, I don't know whether it comes in this bit or a different bit, but the fact that we have our video to teach scheme of work, 
the whole point of which is that it supports um, staff with pronunciation and with entire lessons at the click of a button and it's in video format which they can pause and then you know run the activity and come back to the video and they don't have to worry about pronunciation so there's there's really sort of no excuses and that was one of the quotes wasn't it that one of yeah. the said to me actually my staff don't have an excuse anymore um, because they're so well supported that it's, it's all there for them they just have to have that vision I think if you can convince staff and colleagues that the, the, of the benefits and the positives and like you said the transferable skills of learning a language then um you're halfway there really you are exactly yeah, exactly uh i'm going to skip through these next slides i think uh just taking a second i'll move past these so basically what these I'm are nice videos i will just briefly say they're they're talking about what language detectives means to them in their school so they talk through what it is to be a language detective um Reading comprehension, upper key stage two, for some reason, obsess about reading comprehension. <laughs> they, absolutely, they absolutely love, they feel like they're doing something for second, they feel like they're doing secondary school work. So have you considered reading comprehension? Simple stuff, can you spot the words you know, already know? Can you, can you underline the words you don't know? Can you guess what words those mean? Can you identify verbs? Can you identify the adjectives? Can you identify words that are your friend, maybe a cognate, a word in the, the same in a different language? Um, and can you maybe label some other different ones as well? I know, Kate, you're big on, on, on reading comprehensions and doing Definitely. I just see so many links with literacy and with grammar as well across the curriculum. So even this morning, obviously, it's Sats Week, we had the grammar paper this morning. And as I was, you know, having a little look through, I realised that what, whatever we do in our language lessons just only supports what we're doing in our grammar lessons as well. So you're talking about nouns and adjectives and, and pronouns and prepositions and phrases and word class and all of that terminology and the fact that you're identifying them and using them independently as well and dictionary work to support that as well. It just all helps. It all helps. Cool. Like I say, we are getting near the end now, guys. I'm very aware of that. So thank you for staying along with us. This is the last point, community reach. Things to consider. Once again, you will get these slides. You'll get this recording for you to look and dive in a little deeper yourself. Website, social media. Are you posting stuff on Twitter, your Twitter if you have a Twitter? Are you posting stuff on your website to show off language learning? Do you have partner schools? We, in the network, we link up schools with each other. So that a Spanish learning school with another Spanish learning school. And do some sharing that way. If you can get a link school with a French or a Spanish school or an Arabic school or whichever school language you're learning, then by get, that's just like the gold gold dust and protect that with everything mm. that you've got because it's so important. But if not, there are ways you can get around with it. Maybe you could link up with another school in your cluster and both work on a similar project and post to each other in, in a different language. It's not perfect, but it's a lot better than not doing anything at all. Parents, do they know language learning is occurring in their school? Are you sending home? We've got language detective certificates they can bring home. You might, they might look at Twitter, they might look at social media. Okay. And, and the parents more often not, more often than not, are very excited to see their kids learn a, learn a new language. Yes, sometimes there is disinterest, and I'm not uh, ignorant to that, but 95% above that are really keen to see their, their students um, children, sorry. Uh, learning your language and especially when it's written about them i know kate you really enjoyed it when your kids came back and they've written a mother's day poem for you exactly like wow you know, boom hitch you straight so do stuff that's going to relate to the to the parents uh, that they're going to enjoy and i think that's cyclical as well so the parents have a huge influence obviously on the children's uh, motivation as well so i think only just last week there was some research published from was it cambridge university that said that parents and then obviously teachers as well but really parents are that motivational factor when it comes to children wanting to continue with language learning so if parents aren't convinced we we've, we've got the job of convincing the parents to then in turn convince the children as well of of uh, the benefits of language learning and, and, and carrying on that through in the same vein as your SLT, how you, what's your governor's opinion? Maybe there's one governor on the board that's really keen to language learning. Getting in touch with them might give you some more power in the school. So, you know, start, find out what the governor's opinion on languages is. Maybe, maybe you might need to change that. Have you considered transition? We found we've done a project last year. I'm sure maybe some of you are involved in it. It's tricky. Key stage two to three transition. We could spend another two hours speaking about this. So mm. I'm really I'm sorry that we can only speak 20 seconds about it. But all I'm going to say is, if you can link up with your year seven teacher, then that is fantastic. We, we classify that as an outstanding trait of the school. So, and, 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 and what are you doing? Are they coming down to see the kids or teach a lesson at the end of year, year six? 
with the kids to see what's coming up into Peace Stage 3? Are you emailing in work for them to see? Have you communi- tried to communicate with them? But we understand it's very annoying and actually a big ba- one of the biggest barriers to uh, that, that primary teachers find. We know, we know that for sure. And we're trying to scream for you guys to, to be heard, really, because uh, we understand the importance of that, that jump. Outward facing celebration. So once again, are you showing off what's going on? Are you reaching the wider community of your school with languages? Um, okay. Just some uh, five principles of a summary, five principles of primary learning. These are the five things that we consider are umbrella terms to everything that should go in your languages in primary schools. Number one, effective coordination. Are you doing the subject properly? You know, are you doing it a good job? Teaching and learning, what does it look like? Are people enjoying it? Is progression occurring inside your school? And are you measuring that? Celebrating languages in school, is it being, is, is, are you finding ways of creating hooks within the school that's gonna get kids excited about language learning? Uh, for example, European day languages and other opportunities. School ethos, basically, what do, does the rest of your school think about languages if you to ask one person? Do they know the importance of it? Community reach, what do your parents, governors, SLT, wider community think about languages? Um, and what are you doing to, to promote that? Zoomed out, a wider perspective on language learning. This is a virtual conference. I'm sure Catherine's posting in the chat now. Um, free to sign up, there is no catch whatsoever. We always do a free conference and there's five days of content. There's a Kate's doing a, a bit on self-efficacy and languages and top tips for that. I'm sure after hearing her today, you could tell her level of expertise. Day two is interviews with bilingual teachers in our PLN team, discussions about what it's been like for them to learn English in England or to continue to develop their English learning. So really interesting questions that we want to ask them. Number three is our keynote speaker, Sabine Little. Uh, she's a PhD, she's done PhDs in many uh, research on multilingual Lism in schools, in families in the UK, and the impacts that has upon their experience and also the culture around them or society around them. So we're really interested to dive into kind of um, Sabine's specialism there. And I know Kate's interviewing her as well, and she's really excited to do so to do that. Day four is teaching ideas from our teachers, so just simple ideas. And day five is a chat with multilingual ch- children. We've got the opportunity of speaking to kids uh, in a school in Manchester who's majoritively. Uh, immigrant or refugee um, and we're going to ask them we're going to ask them fun questions we might ask them a couple of uh, deeper questions um, and find out what it's like to be a kid learning English as a second language or having a different language at home to where they are at school just to dive into those those key questions and uh, there's lots of content there's European day languages there's a, a we're creating a teacher pub quiz for your, to do at your school with your teachers to try and get them into involved in languages, a languages pub quiz. And there's many other free resources we're giving away each day, completely free to attend. You just click on the link, sign up and you're done. And it's on the 20th of June. Um, so it's a month and a bit away. So we want, we've got 200, nearly 200 signed up now. So we, we want to try and get to 500 for that event. Um, final thing, and I'm sorry guys that we've run on a little bit, we'll be, I think we'll be four more minutes, so thank you very much for attending everybody, uh, but we got a Twitter poll from uh, the barriers, the main barriers to language learning in schools, and I'm going to put Kate on the spot now, Kate, do you want to go through some of these key points, barriers, and maybe offer a quick tip, quick fix? Okay. Agreement. Can do this. Yeah, let's go. So insufficient time allocation. I get it. it the timetable is really squeezed, as we know. So we spent uh, a bit of time earlier talking about little and often. So uh, the more repetitive you can make your language learning, the better. I think is the simplest uh, message with that one. And those little revisits that are so, so important. Transition. So we uh, took part in the Ask School transition pilot through six into seven, which was the online portal. That was a pilot, as I say, last year. But even if it isn't happening this year, um, you can still access the Ask School descriptors online. So if you did want to create your own document that passes up information and data from year six to year seven, you can do that. Or you can um, speak to whoever's in charge at the high school, so their languages coordinator, and ask them what's useful 
to to be told so do you want to know whether they've done um, parts of a verb or whether they can use a dictionary or do what language learning strategies they've learned because that might then help them when it comes to setting if they set or when it comes to planning and the last thing we want really is that children go right back to the beginning with hello my name is and they start relearning language from scratch because that has been shown to uh, demotivate so to something the message with transition anything is better than nothing um, we've talked about teacher knowledge and confidence haven't we so our videos teach scheme our click to teach scheme which is our powerpoint based scheme of work again supported with audio sound files and all your resources everything is there differentiated with teaching notes as well so if you feel like you need a little bit of backup on a grammar point or um, on how to animate an activity then there is supporting notes as well uh, we've talked about trying to um, you know, tell SLT the benefits of learning languages, the fact it supports throughout the curriculum, the fact that um, if we can, you know, spread the knowledge of you know, the wonders of learning language to our community, to parents, that will only benefit because that will support children taking further languages as they as they go to high school. And the aim is really that I think it's like 90% of children we, we want current year five to be taking the EBAC. Um, by the time they're ready to choose that because that has a language element in it and obviously that's really good um, for for this country and for languages in general we've talked about languages at links with literacy already um phonics so we have actually done we've got a blog post on phonics we've got a master class on phonics as well so it can be taught discreetly but also it can be done incidentally and our scheme of work really builds it in so there's no need to worry about having to teach it as a separate thing it's already built in and it's revisited really really often with all tongue twisters and um speaking activities etc um We've talked about wider school community as well, I think. So actually, we've covered quite a few of these barriers as yeah. we've discussed those, those uh, principles. We've talked about our language uh, CPD journey, ITT support. So really, this is where it all begins, isn't it? So teacher trainers need to know what languages provision and teaching languages provision is all about before they even start teaching. So we, as a company, Joanne Eccles, share my colleague, um, is often supporting initial teacher trainers. Um, we're working with NASBIT as well, who they deliver support for, um, for, for trainee teachers. So we're really, you know, at the, the starting blocks for, for lots of teachers on, in their career and hopefully supporting them throughout so that they feel confident. Budget restrictions, yes, absolutely. So I think that the message with this is if you can get in early with your budget request, so whether it be membership to a scheme of work or something that's just going to provide you with a, a robust scheme of work that's got progress built into it with all the necessary support, whether it be audio sound files, videos, resources, get that request in early and, and have a trial. So have a trial of whichever scheme of work you want to try. And if it works for you, then you've got that... Um, that backup really, haven't you, of, of, of um, why you're asking for the money. And I think a little goes a long way, really. So once you've got membership, particularly of PLN, then there's no added, co added cost onto that. Everything's included, all your CPD, all your resources, everything. So, so a little goes a long way. Progress, we started off, didn't we, talking about what progress looks like in all the four core skills and um, consistency in learning. So just reiterating that message that it is supposed to be um, part of that broad and balanced curriculum that all children should have access to. And key stage one. So really, really importantly, I call key stage one. It's like the trailer to the movie, isn't it? It's like the, the advert really. So obviously but we're not, you know, we're not specified to teach languages at key stage one, but I really find with the schools I work with, those that are delivering provision at key stage one, They've got little linguists there already, all ready to go when they start in year three because they've their, their ears have been educated. We call it education of the ear, key stage one. It's very short inputs, songs, games, activities, maybe only 10, 15 minutes, but it just gets them hooked and they absolutely adore it in general. Um, they really, really enjoy themselves. They sort of not got them in inhibitions, so they're happy to sing and dance and do silly actions. And it just is a great basis for them starting their, uh, their, um, their four main years of language learning. Okay. That's everything. So well done. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, guys. Um, unless any questions wanted to be asked. Uh, Joe, is there anything you'd like to add? 
um, just an uh, incredible presentation, really, really comprehensive. Love the uh, the five principles. And I think you've addressed every possible question around primary languages, really, this evening in, in one hour, just over one hour. So I think you've both done a cracking job. And and it's very obvious that you've done this many times before, both of you, the way that you tag each other. And uh, it's quite like Kate says something and then Will says something and then Kate says something. It just works really smoothly and lovely. So uh, uh, I think it's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Um, I have asked if there's any other questions in the chat. But uh, Catherine has done a brilliant job in uh, addressing. Yeah, uh, you, Catherine and, and Emily have done brilliant jobs in thanks providing you. links and uh, and so on and so forth. Um, I think what I'm going to do now is I'm going to give people the opportunity to turn on their microphones and their and their videos if they'd like to. Maybe if they'd like to ask a question or just say thank you or what have you. I think that'd be so. We are still recording, so you will appear on the recording. But I will uh, do that now. I think if people want to st uh, start their videos or uh, unmute themselves, you can now do that. If you wanted to ask Will or Kate um, a question or want to just say thanks, feel free to uh, to do that right now. And uh, we'll just see if, if anyone's feeling brave enough. Mrs. Buckley, would you like to say something? <laughs> just thank you, really. Really, it was really interesting, really well delivered. You know, lots to think about there and reminders about things as well. So, yeah, so thank you. Thanks, Jill. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> and thanks, thank you for all your contributions in the chat as well, Jill. That's been lovely. Anybody else feeling brave who wants to say something right now? You don't have to. There's no, there's no obligation. And we've still got lots of people watching right now, which is great. So it's been a really good turnout as well. Yeah. So there's lovely. lots of thank yous in the chat, to be fair, Joe. So yeah. No, you, yeah, I'm not surprised. A very, very slick, very professional very dynamic presentation uh, and yeah it's it's been it's been very very interesting okay so if there's no one else that wants to turn the microphone on or the video on i think it comes to the, it comes to this point in the evening when i thank um kate and will for giving such a great webinar for everybody coming along um for those people who are watching the recording thank you so much for finding the time to watch the recording um i'll be sharing the recording on 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 twitter of course, as normal, I, very, I was very proud of the the MFL Twitterati on Sunday when they answered all these different uh, uh, barriers around primary languages. There's, if you if you find my original tweet, you'll see there's a whole thread of different uh, different comments and and um, uh, and and challenges. Um, and I think that uh, that sort of whatever it was a one minute challenge there of of Kate going through and answering everything <laughs> was just incredible absolutely incredible <laughs> um so that's yeah I, I think um this is going to give everyone lots of food for thought about how they can um deal with um primary languages how they can ask for support all the all the wonderful support that you're providing all the um the lovely resources that have been posted in the chat there is the trial that you can do if you want to find out more if you want to get involved and uh, I'm sure uh, PLN, which stands for Primary Languages Network, I did make a bit of a, uh, a fist of that at the beginning, but anyway, Primary Languages Network, I'm sure they would absolutely love to hear from you. And uh, that, that conference also looks brilliant. I've been to the last couple virtually, um, and it's always really, really fascinating and interesting. So I'd really encourage everyone to go along to the, uh, the PLN conference uh, in just over a month's time. So thanks ever, uh, ever so much, everyone again. And uh, you've, all been, you've all been great. And um, I look forward to seeing you at the next one. Um, so I'm going to stop recording right now.